wonderful, wonderful. God bless you. You glad you're here? Woo. Thank you. Unexpected round of applause there. <laughs> it's good to be with you. How many of you were here yesterday at all? Just wave at me. Oh, a good number of you. That's fantastic. I'm not here on my own. This is my lovely wife, Sarah. Sarah, stand up. Uh, give him a twirl. That's fantastic. We had a fabulous time with you uh, yesterday. We love this church. We love the way you worship. We love the way you teach. We love your conversation, the vocabulary you have about uh, hope and destiny and future. It's brilliant. You know you're in a great church, don't you? Oh. You know you're in a great church, don't you? Good. And you know you're in safe hands, don't you? Good. That's fantastic. Uh, I love taking photos when I'm at other churches, so I hope the people on the platform didn't mind as I was uh, taking uh, snapshots. I'm quite nosy. Uh, my, wife, uh, my wife says I'm nosy. Um, she didn't tell me. I read it in her diary. <laughs> as I was rifling through her drawers <laughs> at her bedside, which she does, which I do when she's out, because I, I am... I am nosy, you know. You gotta keep your eye on your keep your eye on your wife. As I was arrived, I found this this egg box. Egg box. And and I opened the egg box and in it were three eggs and one hundred pounds. I thought that's 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 really strange. Anyway, it was so strange that I couldn't just put it away and not not mention it. So so when she came home I said, Darling, what what's this? I mean after you know, telling me off for being nosy. Um, I said, what's this? What's the, the th three eggs in there? She says, well, look, I'm, I made this pledge that when we got married, every time you preached a bad sermon, I would put an egg in the box. Well, we've been married 32 years now, coming up 33 years. I thought, that's not bad, is it? <laughs> That's not bad at all. And I said, what's the hundred pounds? She said, every time I got a dozen, I sold them for a pound. <laughs> so, um, which changes the whole complexion, doesn't it, of the, of the situation. No, it is lovely to be with you. And our theme for this weekend uh, was growing together and understanding that actually, although we all have our personal relationship with Jesus, have you noticed when you open the Bible and you flip through it, it's very difficult to find a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Uh, but it's more about a corporate relationship with Jesus. Although we believe, don't we, that if you were the only person left on the planet, Jesus would have come and lived and died and rose again for you. The point is, he didn't. He did it for the world. He did it for an us. He did it for a we. And when you read the epistles through the New Testament, they are written to groups of people, to churches, struggling with life together, learning how to do life together. And that's what's wonderful about local church. That's what's wonderful about worshiping together in song worship about hearing each other worship and about sitting in the same room and hearing the same thing and trying to chew over it together. So that's why Growing Together, I think, is a, is a great title. And the theme we took was to break this down into to four words. And we started yesterday with just a little talk about belonging. Belonging. What does it mean to belong? And one of the key things from that message was this, that Jesus went around showing people that they belonged in his presence way before they believed or behaved. And that's quite important for us to understand. And it's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to us how we treat each other and how we treat people who are yet to find this church and yet to find Jesus. What sense of belonging do they have even well before they believe or behave. Then we, we then want, went on to talk about uh, believe, and, and Sarah shared about the importance of belief in an age where people are very fluid in their beliefs. There are some things, some things that we need to be very clear about. The first thing we need to be clear about is we need to believe that we need a belief. 
Second thing is we need to believe that we are in need because our neediness leads to a thirst and thirst is God's currency. And then the third thing is we need to believe. Finally, when we come to know him, we need to believe that he's risen and he rules. He is not an imaginary friend or a genie in a bottle. He's not the magic man who turns up when we pray hard enough. He's risen and he rules. And then we went on to a slightly more difficult subject of behave. What does it mean to behave as a believer? And we're all called, I guess, to close the gap between what we believe and how we behave. Because there is a gap for all of us. And we're called through our life to close that gap. And uh, we must never mistake God's patience for his approval. Sometimes we get away with things in our life for long periods of time. Sometimes people can get through their whole life walking on slippery rocks or engaging in shady places or shady practices. And because God hasn't intervened, they think they've got God's approval, but really God is just being incredibly patient. And we, we learned those things. Today we're going to talk about... Um, the challenge of becoming something in Christ. But first, um, let's read Scripture. It's always a good thing to do. And we've centered all our talks around just a few verses, two or three verses, and, and they're going to appear on the screen. But I thought uh, this morning it would be helpful for me just to read a couple of verses before these ones arrive. Is that all right? So I'm going to uh, read a few verses, and then when it comes to the ones that we're centering everything around, maybe we could read them out loud together. That would be great. So I'm going to read from the first chapter of Colossians. St. Paul is writing to this church in Colossae, and he says this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We will continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. And please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience. They're not the most, um, they're not the most attractive of traits. Endurance and patience, are they? I mean, why not some pizzazz? Why not so we can have some pizzazz, Lord? Why not so that we can have a spring in our step and have some real exuberant joy? But here, St. Paul lists some things that we might walk into, that we might become, so that we can have endurance and patience. Wow, that's challenging. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then on the screen, let's read these two slides together. Here we go. Jesus is the image... Oh, come on. Give me some. Give me some. Here we go. Jesus is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and earth were created, whether visible or invisible, thrones, rulers, authorities, and powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let's just pray for a moment. Perhaps you'd put your hand somewhere near your heart. Father God, you have our hearts this morning, have our attention. We thank you for the lofty words we've just read about your all-surpassing greatness, and that we are even here because it was done through you and in you, and we live for you. And yet we know by your Holy Spirit you want to do business with us this morning. 
maybe something particular and peculiar to each of us because you call us on to become something. So Lord, will you give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to obey? We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. So um, we learned yesterday that Jesus says, um, come and come as you are. But Jesus doesn't say, stay as you are, right? And as church folk, as Jesus people, we need to carry the tension of those two things in our lives all the time. We need to accept the warmth of his grace and his love, which is continually saying to us, come as you are. And yet, no, there is also this challenge of Jesus saying to us, but don't stay as you are. Now, look, I would rather live here, accept Jesus saying to me, come as you are, and then be able to get on my merry way doing all the things that I really love and enjoy and that seem to fulfill me in my selfish, self-centered way. But he doesn't. He says, come as you are. And if you come as you are, and you embrace me in a sense of belonging, you believe what you believe, and you're willing to behave, then there is a becoming. There is a becoming. And that will, in some real true way, be very different for each of us. There isn't a standard, a, a standard look for what all Christians become. That's the wonderful thing, that God knows how you're knitted together, I don't know. Your pastors don't know. We can have a stab at it, but God knows. So our journey of what we will become is truly up to your relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. And yet, in a community, we can spur each other on, on that journey of becoming. Do we believe that? So why should we even bother wanting to become something? Well, the verse tells us, if Jesus is who he says he is, that all things were created in him, through him, and for him, what alternative do we have? We, we become what the person who thought us up and designed the best life for us, we become what he wants, knowing that what he, he wants is best for us. And how do we become something? Well, as a minimum, as a minimum, if we know we belong somewhere, we're willing to believe something, and we're willing to change our behavior, then we're already on the way to becoming, as a minimum. But there is a bit more to it, and we'll get to that this morning. Look, if you read your Bibles, you will already know that from the first page to the last page, there is a thread of God's people becoming something. Although we all have seasons, and let's lay that out there and be truthful, we all have seasons in life of staticness and plateau. That happens individually, it happens church-wise. And we believe in seasons, and, and there should never be a pressure for us all to sort of be on an upward curve like this in our spiritual growth. The truth is, stuff happens to us. There are lessons that we learn in the flatlands. And there are lessons that we learn on the steep inclines. And so we should never put pressure on each other to, to be on this great spiritual inclination. Where by the 10 years of walking with Jesus, we are giants of the faith. That's not how it works. There are seasons to life. So why bother teaching about becoming if, if we just behave right, it's natural consequence? Why bother teaching about it at all? Well, the truth is this, because the future you may be a real challenge to the you of now. That sounds a weird... What have you just said, Russ? That sounds weird. That, uh, that's what you're all thinking. Look... The fut if you are becoming something, the future you may be a challenge to the you of now. Let me try and explain that. Uh, Jesus once 
uh, described the challenge of following him this way. He didn't say, if you hang on my shirt tails and learn from me and belong to me and follow me, you will naturally become something. He didn't say that. What he actually said was, if you want to build a tower, sit down now and count the cost. In other words, if you follow me, if you believe certain things and try and change your behavior to match with what is good and righteous, there is a cost to that. You will change. The you of the future will be different to the you of now. So sit down now and decide, is that something you want? Is that interesting that Jesus would do that? If you want to build a tower, sit down and count the cost. Have you ever thought about a caterpillar and a butterfly? Right? Caterpillar and a butterfly. And I find this really, really strange. Uh, here we go. Think of a caterpillar, right? What do caterpillars eat? Leaves. They eat leaves, right? That's where you find them most. I mean, you find them in other places if they've fallen off or if they're, or if they're getting from leaf to leaf. But they crawl along a leaf and they eat Leaves. Right. Pause. Think about that. They eat leaves. Now, eventually, a caterpillar becomes a, a butterfly. Um, what does a butterfly eat? Nectar. Nectar. Right? Nectar is formed by sunlight being caught by leaves on plants. Right? And then turned into something sweet. So let me get this right. A butterfly, in order to live, needs nectar, which is formed by sunlight, which can only be caught by leaves, in order to live. The juvenile butterfly eats... Right? The, the juvenile butterfly eats the very thing. The juvenile uh, caterpillar eats the very thing that the grown-up butterfly needs to live on. Does that seem strange? Seem topsy -to Have you ever thought about that? I think about these things. It's weird for me. If the future you needs something to live on, why would the younger you eat it up, right? Now, thank goodness there's plenty of leaves to go around, but it still seems, still seems nonsensical to me. A man came up to Jesus once, Clever man, bright chap, well-to-do, he was wealthy, he was rich, came up probably on his horse and he said, uh, Rabbi, I want what you've got. I want eternal life. I want these things you've been teaching about. I've had my spies out listening to what you've said and, and I want that. And interestingly, Jesus did something that only Jesus would do. <laughs> And that maybe we shouldn't do. He asked the man a series of questions about his behavior. The man cheated on the answers a little bit. And then Jesus said, if you want what I've got, give away all your money to the poor. See, Jesus didn't say what he'd said to other people. To other people, Jesus said, come, follow me. Right? Right? But Jesus said something really strange to this rich man. Give away all your money to the poor. Now that's a hard thing to say. I mean, if I said that, or Pastor Jonathan said that to someone, I mean, we would, that would be going the annals of Destiny Church history as being too harsh, right? That would go in the little black book. But Jesus said it. What, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is Jesus is teaching this man a lesson that he might as well figure out there is a cost to this. If you want to follow me and yet hold on to everything that your life revolves around now, which is money and wealth, in the, in the future you're going to get your comeuppance. So let's deal with it now. If you want to follow me, you let go of this. Now, I don't think that's a practice for life that we all engage in. Let's not treat each other that way. Jesus was the son of God. He could see the future. He knew what was happening with this guy. And so he could call him out. But it is interesting that transformation 
is a very real thing. When people follow Jesus seriously, they become different. And the different people that they become can live a very different way from the people they are now, right? Butterfly, caterpillar. Rich man giving up his money, if he ever did, compared to a man revolving around his wealth. Have you ever thought about the great St. Paul, who was previously was Saul, the great pers persecutor of Christians? I like to think about this, that the new and transformed Paul, after he died, would have been welcomed into paradise to the cheers and applause of the very people the old Paul would have dragged to their death. Let me say that again. The new St. Paul, when he died, would have been welcomed into heaven with cheers and applause from the very people the old Paul was dragging to their death. Can I say that again? Just so you get this. Because it talks about transformation. The new Paul, after he died, when he was welcomed into heaven, would have been welcomed there to the cheers and the applause of people the previous Paul would have dragged to their deaths. It's astounding the difference Jesus can make in people's lives if they're willing to be belong, believe, and be transformed. Here's a truth. If you want to write this down, write it down. It will appear on the screen, I think. You can't be all that God wants you to be and all the world expects you to be. You can't be all that God wants you to be at the same time as being all the world expects you to be. And this is a challenge for all of us who are following Jesus. Because we make our choice. Do we want to be people? Do we want to become people who are all that, who, who are what God wants us to be? Or do we want to be people who the world expects us to be? There's also the challenge of this. Not many people can be all that God wants them to be and all that they themselves ever want to be. Because some of our desires are selfish and self-centered. And yet God knows best. And when he calls Devishan, and he says, Devishan, well done for belonging to me. You've embraced me. You can stay there. So. And, uh, and well done for believing. I know you struggle with your belief like everyone, but well done for believing. And well done for changing your behavior. Now, Devishan, are you willing to become someone different? Or do you want to stay like this? Because if you want to follow me, you will become someone different. Now, there's a challenge for us. Because we are all drawn to comfort and to ease. And there is nothing comfortable or easy about following Jesus. There's an interesting word used in Scripture when it talks about transformation and I know you love transformation you have a language of transformation at Destin the word that the the writers of the New Testament use for the word transformation is the word metamorph metamorph right it means a a, a change of form or a change of essence that's what it means a change of form or a change of essence you'll have all heard the word metamorphosis I'm sure and most of you will have first heard the word metamorphosis probably when you were at school and a, a teacher was teaching about metamorphosis and maybe they had in a, a, a tank somewhere a caterpillar and some leaves uh, and as children you would gather around it and you were, every day you would watch and see what's happening to the caterpillar anyone did that in school a few of you okay and we all know a caterpillar metamorphosizes into a, a caterp into a butterfly. And there we are. You would watch it every day and see what's happening to this caterpillar. And then one day, something strange would happen. 
and the caterpillar would change its, its look and it would find this, this cocoon, this, this chrysalis. It would form it itself. It would sort of emit the kind of things that envelop it in a, in a little semi-transparent bag and it would disappear from view. Do you remember that? You've seen it on YouTube. You've seen it on TV. That's what happens to a caterpillar. Now, I remember being taught at school that this is what happens. The caterpillar loses its legs and other bits of its body, uh, and it grows new stuff. It grows wings. That's what's happening in this bag, right? It disappears from view into the bag, and it loses its legs, and it grows wings. Anyone heard that kind of thing? Yeah, and, and it makes sense because what comes out a few days later is something that looks totally different. Totally different. The odd thing is this. We should have all noticed this when we were kids. What emerges at the other end doesn't look like a caterpillar with wings. The middle bit doesn't look like a caterpillar. It looks like something totally different, right? It's a different shape. The head and the, and the body and the, the abdomen are different. Now, scientists, those of you who are scientists or into biology, you will know this. You'll be well ahead of me. But look, a caterpillar does not shed its legs and grow wings. The whole thing dissolves into a goo. You're looking at me as if, no, it doesn't, Russ. It does. Check it out. Okay. I know. I've read the scientific paper. It's true. It, no, the scientists, they know, right? And the caterpillar itself turns into a globular mass of goo. Can you say goo? Yeah. Who would have thought you'd have this in a sermon on a Sunday morning, right? I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's just a blob. And it must be awful for Kath to sign right now. This is the word for goo. Is very difficult to sign, I'm sure. But, but that's what happens. If you could break into that semi-transparent bag and look into it, you would just find, oh, that's what it would be. And what happens is, it's as if the caterpillar disappears and dies. And the proteins and the DNA that are now throughout this globular mass, they reform into a new creature okay a new creature a butterfly is not a caterpillar with wings a butterfly is a new creature that once was a caterpillar and we use the word metamorphosis to describe it and the writers in the new testament use the same word to describe what happens when they are talking about this wonderful principle of the old has passed away and the new has come. Okay? You decide to follow Jesus. You accept his grace. You belong to him. You believe some rudimentary things about him. And then you do your best to behave, to behave in that way. And if you're willing to go on that journey of becoming with him, the old you dies and a new you comes into being Paul the apostle when he writes about it he, he calls it the old man and the new man right some people when he talks about the old man thinks they were talking about his dad or something he wasn't right he's not the old man at home it's just like the old man the old me the old creature and the new creature me I'm emerging I've passed through this this death experience of finding my new identity in Christ, and I'm becoming, metamorphosizing, something new. I believe new things. I see new things. I have a new worldview. I feel new things. That's a powerful thought. 2 Corinthians 5.17 uh, says this, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That's all about becoming. 
Now, here's the difference between a caterpillar and you. Because if a caterpillar just belongs and eats and heads where it's supposed to, it will transform into a butterfly. You get that, right? There are not many caterpillars that don't transform into a butterfly. A caterpillar, however, cannot abdicate from the process. You can. And I can. And here's the challenge. God is desperate for me to become the Russ he wants me to be. The one that is fulfilled in him. The one where he can squeeze his goodness through me and it fills me and it overflows to people around me. You get that? And we, and we could go through each of our names and say that God is desperate for that to be the case. And if we were just like a caterpillar, that process would be normal. It would just happen. But a caterpillar can't abdicate from the process. I can. I can look up at God and go, no. No, I enjoy this too much. No, that seems too difficult. No, if I have to follow you, I have to let go of this. No. We have the will to be able to abdicate from the process. And a lot of us do at different times in our lives. And yet God in his grace still calls us on. There is a tussle between the old me and the new me, a struggle, a fight. Paul the Apostle describes it. He says he struggles. He says he contends with the old him and the new him all the time, this old me and the new me. He wants to become something for Jesus, and yet the old him is contending for power in his life. There's an old... Um, an old story, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's of a, a Cherokee Indian chief in the, the lands in the New World when they were just being discovered by Europeans. And, and the old Cherokee uh, chief was teaching his son, and he said, son, there's a, there's a fight going on inside me between two wolves, a, a good wolf and a bad wolf, the good and the bad, the dark and the light. And the son says to him, which one wins, dad? And the Cherokee chief says, the one I feed. And he is the rub, folks. He is the rub. You want to become all that God wants for you? You want to walk into that? And he, he's calling you on. But there is an old you. And it is drawn to the things that are comfortable and full of ease and would rather stay as you are than be drawn into things of God. And they are in contention against each other. Okay, which one will win? I'll tell you which one will win. The one you feed. The one you feed. And that's why... The writers in the New Testament write things like this. Make every effort to add to your faith. Goodness. Increase your faith. Press forward. Strain towards the goal. Because, because it takes something to walk into what God has for you. To become what he has for you. My prayer for you is that you hear the call of God to become all he that he wants for you to be and are willing to engage in that tussle. Now let me just pause a moment here. Would you close your eyes for me? I'm going to be ending very soon. There'll be people in this place who you're well established followers of Jesus. You've been on the road a long time. You know, you belong to him, you believe what you believe, and you know your behavior has changed. And yet, you're not yet satisfied that 
that you've walked all the walk that God wants you to do. I want to urge you. Hear God again say to you, come as you are. Hear him say again, please don't stay as you are. With my grace, my love, with the people I've planted you alongside in this church, you can become all I want you to be. Feed, feed the you of the future. Eat the stuff that the you of the future needs to be. Read the stuff that the you of the future needs to be. Go to the places that the you of the future needs to go to. Because the you that you feed will be the you that wins. And there may be people here this morning and you've been to church lots of times. Maybe not. Maybe this is your first time. And you've... You've heard songs sung about the transformation power of Jesus Christ. You've heard prayers prayed and you've, you've heard me talk about transformation and something right now in your heart is just saying, I, I, don't, know, I don't know whether I can believe it all, but, but I'm not satisfied, I'm not fulfilled. I'm, I sense a call to follow this Jesus, but I don't know enough. Well, I wonder if just everyone would pray this short prayer after me. And those of you who feel you need to pray it with sincerity in your heart, then you do that today. Let's everyone pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for living to show me how to live. Thank you for dying to rescue me. Thank you for rising again to offer me new life. I'm sorry for how I've harmed myself. Sorry for how I've harmed my relationship with others. And how I've harmed my relationship with you. Forgive me. Wash me clean. Make me new. I invite you into my life and I give my life to you. Holy Spirit, teach me. Give me strength to follow you. Now, still with our eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it sincerely in your heart, then this could be the most important moment of your life. And we wouldn't want you to leave this place without having opportunity to talk to someone and pray with someone about what you've just done. And so at the end, perhaps you could just, while people are mixing and mingling, just head over to the connect point and just say to someone there, hey, I prayed that prayer. That's all you need to do. Just tell the person at the connect point, I prayed that prayer. They will help you or they'll find someone just to spend a few minutes helping you. For the rest of us, believers, we belong, we believe, we're learning to behave. The challenge is, are we willing to become all that God wants us to be? This final thought from Scripture, you can open your eyes. Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, what his good and pleasing will is for your life. I want to know what God's will is for my life. I want to know it. I puzzle about it all the time. People talk to me as a pastor and say, what's God's will for my life? I'll tell you what it is. Walk on the journey of transformation 
and you will be able to test and approve what his will is for your life. Sarah's getting an egg out of her bag right now. Uh, so I'm going to finish. Whoever's up next, come and take over from me. We're going to do whatever we need to do right now. God bless you.